And a pleasant good morning. Sean, thank you for coming in. Uh, I'm Bill Bateman. This is Faculty Insights. And our special guest this morning is Professor Sean Patterson from the Political Science Department and new to SOU. Did I get all of that right? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for taking time to come on in. Let's start it out with uh, finding out about you as an individual. Are you, you single? You're married? You got kids? Where are you from? What's your sign? All that stuff. <laughs> well, a, a Scorpio. Um, uh, born in Delaware. Went to college uh, at Brown in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Then I did grad school in Los Angeles at UCLA. Mm -hmm. a postdoc at Vanderbilt in Nashville. And now I'm holed up in St. Louis waiting for the pandemic to pass before relocating to Ashland. So I've been, I've been uh, all over the country. Um, I have a, a partner, Hannah, who is a uh, physical therapist in training here at mm -hmm. uh, Wash U. And I have two cats, Minnie and Luna. Outstanding. Well, we're, we're up to date on that. What led you to the path of education? Um, how come you didn't become like a, a fireman or a, an astronaut or a, a brain surgeon? <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing about my career path was I always knew I wanted to be a teacher in some capacity. Um, I wrote, I found it in, in my mother's attic, some essay in sixth grade about how I wanted to be a teacher. Um, when I graduated high school, like I, I won like a little scholarship for future teachers. Um, but all this time I thought I wanted to be a high school geometry teacher. I wanted to teach geometry to 10th graders. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and so I went to college studying, uh, math and chemistry. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep in one of my orgo classes. And when I woke up, uh, uh, Professor Wendy Schiller was coming in to teach her American presidency class. And all of a sudden I was like, this, this is better. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> uh, this and I like. This, this I like. I can get behind this. It was, it was a very engaging lecture about uh, Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and the war on poverty. And I was like, you know what? This, th this is a little more lively. Uh, and so I, I changed majors that semester, became a political scientist, and uh, never looked back. Nice. Well, outstanding. You've certainly picked a uh, interesting time to be in the field of politics. Uh, with everything that's going on, regardless of your political persuasion, uh, it, it's not dull. It is not dull. It, it makes it very easy to teach in this environment. The students are very engaged. Tell me about uh, how you're working through the COVID business, this social distancing, being on Zoom versus in a classroom. And have you come up with anything that you found just, wow, this really helps, or boy, this is really an impediment. How, how's that working out with you as an individual? I mean, a part of why I enjoy teaching so much is the interactions with the students and actually being in the classroom and working with them. And so... I can't sugarcoat it. Teaching behind a screen isn't it isn't the ideal for me, but I think I've found ways to 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 get around the 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 worst of the disconnect. Um, so, so for example, one of the classes I'm teaching this quarter is uh, public opinion and survey research methods, and the research methods component of that involves a lot of learning new statistical software, how to interact with data, how to make graphs, how to present your results. And that's a very hands-on process. The screen sharing component of Zoom allows me to work one-on-one -on -one with students in a way that like, I find a little bit easier than had I even been in the classroom with them. Um, right. I can right. just be like, share your screen. I, I can look right at your code. I can be like, oh, you have, you have a problem on line 12. Right, and we we can get them uh, off on the on the right track a lot faster, and with with most people working from home, it you know it, it makes your schedule slightly more flexible, and so I can I can meet with students more so on times that work for them, whereas when I would have office hours on campus, right. it was right. it, it was a little more difficult to schedule that. 
Um, I've also found that the, the, the structure I've ad adapted for my substantive classes of I'll record the lectures beforehand and then in one of the weekly time blocks we'll meet and just have a discussion about the class material. I've, I've found that that actually helps. It gives us enough time that the discussions can really start to grow and we can really bring in a lot of current events and other issues that the students are concerned about. Whereas when I would just lecture in class and try and get a discussion going at the end, only having, you know, 10 or 15 minutes for discussion kind of limited how far we could get and, and how many connections we could we could form. Well, the flipping of the classroom is really turning into something that is quite effective for people when they're working in a remote format because they can chew on that lecture first and then they come in with questions and comments and ideas that's going to, as you say, create a far more uh, productive environment. And I know the new environment isn't for everyone, but I think having the luxury of breaking lectures up into more manageable chunks so you can you can watch 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there, it, it, it fits better into people's schedules. It allows you to review the material more than once. Um, I'd love to be able to give my lecture three or four times to students in class, but I, it, we're all cut. We're all a little short on time. So this yeah. allows them to go back and listen to it a couple times, make sure they get the main, the main concepts. And like you said, then it's percolating. And by the time we get to class to discuss it, they have, they, they, they've engaged with the material enough that we can, we can, we can dig deep into those concepts. What are you looking for? for your students to take away from your class and go out into society with and not on a great, you know, I'm going to go out and change the world. But when you encounter uh, some of these political issues we're dealing with, what are you hoping you can share both short term and long term? So, so my philosophy for political science classes, it, it, it comes from my, my love of the Eagles born and raised outside of Philadelphia, like I am an Eagles fan. My okay. great grandmother on her deathbed was cursing out the Cowboys. It, it, <laughs> it, it's deep in our bones how much we love the Eagles. We bleed, we bleed that very particular shade of green. But I can, I can see when the Cowboys draft well. I admit when the Cowboys score a touchdown. I can appreciate different hiring decisions among the coaching staff. I want my students to leave my classroom with the same appreciation for football that I, or sorry, the same appreciation for politics that I have for football. Gotcha. I want them to think about it institutionally. I want them to think about it in terms of the rules and procedures and how that can form a, a predictable set of expectations about how the, how the, these processes should work. And so we all have our teams, we all have our loyalties, we all have the, the things that we care deeply about, but I'm here to teach you the rules of the game. And once you understand the rules of the game, then you can go out into the real world and have expectations about how this is going to unfold. Okay, I want to pick up on that again in a second, but looking at SOU, uh, we're a small college in Southern Oregon, what drew you to Southern Oregon University? Well, strangely enough, I, I'd been to Ashland before. My, uh, my advisor in, uh, in my PhD program actually summers in Ashland, like his house is, is in downtown Ashland. And he, he always told all the, how much he loved Southern Oregon and how beautiful it was and how happy he was to get out of, out of town. And so when I saw that Southern Oregon was looking for a political scientist who, who studied institutions. I was like, I, I have to give this, I have to give this a gander. Give it a and shot. And then when I came out, I was like, this place is lovely. <laughs> but, but more specifically to, to the school itself, I've always gotten so much out of teaching that I always knew I, I wanted to be at an institution that allowed me to both, you know, continue my research but that also, that also took seriously the, the, uh, a professor's commitment to teaching and provided resources for, for you know, that aspect of my career. Um, and so, you know, it was a no brainer. <laughs> well, outstanding. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you for choosing us. <laughs> 
Uh, going back to what we were talking about, we have in football, and I'll, I love that, the comparison, we have people who are diehard fans for one side or the other. Uh, they don't shoot each other all that often. I think, do, do you have a thought? You I don't follow Philadelphia sports very closely. I don't. I'm a West Coast guy. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what the heck happened? When did we become so tribal, so uh, divisive? I mean, I'm sure you could do a book on this, but. Uh, there, are, there are many books on the subject. Um, so, so my, my big takeaway that I, I want to leave my students with is that the, the polarization that we observe today is the byproduct of processes that have been in the works for a, a pretty long time. Um, we can trace the, the polarization that we're observing today at least back to the late 1970s, early 1980s, if not before then. Um, as, as, the, as the, the Southern US states reacted to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, they increasingly started voting Republican up and down the ticket, which eliminated a large block of conservative Southern Democrats in Congress. And as a result, the parties began to increasingly sort between their ideologies. Republicans lost a lot of seats in New England, having their, you know, the moderate Republicans of New England, the Southern Democrats lost a lot of seats with the conservative Southern Democrats. And so there were a lot fewer, what we would call moderates, members of their party that were, you know, ideologically dissimilar. And then once you had these two cohesive parties, you know, Democrats, the liberal party and Republicans, the conservative party, voters started to follow suit. And those conservative Democrats increasingly become Republicans, those Republicans increasingly become uh, Democrats. And the important thing about that explanation is it doesn't involve anybody changing how they feel about the issues. It's just moving your party to increasingly uh, bring that ideology into alignment. And so we used to have two diverse parties on ideological grounds that are now very homogenous. And we can just see that process now. It's trickled down to our state governments, to local governments. It's trickling down to voters. We're increasingly sorting between these two camps. And when you have fewer cross, uh, you know, cross-cutting cleavages, there's fewer opportunities for collaboration, for cooperation, for uh, compromise. And that's what leads to this, this environment that we, we have today. Once you start to view the other party, not as the opposition, but as your opponent, our lizard brains from way back when begin to start triggering in-group, out-group preferences, motivated reasoning, selective exposure, and we just start fueling a fire that's been growing for quite a long time. I watched, uh, I don't know if you saw it, the newsroom with Jeff Daniels. It was on HBO, Aaron Sorkin. Uh, he goes after the Tea Party in a big way. Uh, at the time of that program was filmed, he was talking about the Tea Party methodology and the, the whole big business of the Koch brothers. And uh, we hear both sides screaming like Kate Brown takes millions from Blomberg and somebody else takes millions from this group and this pack. Add to that the religious component. Is there a, is there a back door to this or are, are we just determined to bump? I've talked to more people. I would never expect to use terms like civil war or confrontation. I'm hearing this from old people, older than me, which is what the hell? I wish I had some silver bullet explanation or you know some silver bullet solution that I could recommend for issues of uh, how to solve polarization. But the problem with trying to address the issue now is like, as I, as I was saying, this is, this is a, the chickens coming home to roost for a process that's 40 years in the making. Mm -hmm. And once that boulder's rolling down a hill that fast for that long, it's really hard to stop. And so a lot of the solutions that we hear 
talked about in the news as possible solutions, they're, they're addressing the short term implications of our polarized system. And they're not dealing with that root cause from the, from the get go. The last time the, the nation was this polarized was right before the Civil War. And so, you know, is a, an armed conflict that kills 10% of the male population the only solution? I hope not. I hope not either. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's not the, the, the message that I, I want people to take away from this, but it is a big problem that needs a big solution and changing our electoral systems or changing how we regulate campaign finance or changing the primary process little things like this aren't going to address a problem this big and this systematic one thing i was curious and i'd like your opinion on i saw during the ken burns film the civil war talking about polarization uh, a historian, and I think it was James Bierce, uh, saying one of the key problems with America at that time is we lost the ability to compromise. We've always thought of ourselves as uncompromising, but in fact, America is built on compromising. That was his position. I find many people today will believe in a UFO behind the moon. Yes, that's up there, but they won't be willing to listen to another viewpoint Uh and the conspiracies, oh my God, uh, COVID is just a hoax. There's nothing wrong. Don't wear a mask. My partner's a nurse. She sees it every day. Wow. What is your opinion? And is there, I don't think there's a silver bullet, but is there a way around this that we as creative human beings can come up with? There is a, a, a great book that I, that I always try and have my undergrads read whenever I can. Um, it's called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And it explains how humans came to develop their senses of right and wrong, their senses of morality. And his, his argument is essentially based a little bit out of evolution. When we were lizards, we had very basic brains that just needed to survive. We need to get food. We need to, we need to react to our situations as fast as we can to solve a problem. The, the front part of our brain that does the thinking and the reasoning and coming up with explanations, that came a lot later on in the process. We got that all, much later in the game. And so if you think about how humans react to things in the environment, 95% of what we do is reacting with these innate processes mm -hmm. and then coming up with explanations to justify it after the fact. And it's very difficult to get your brain to think about something before you do it. Oh, yeah. we, we, we react to the world around us in a way that's motivated from a lot of evolutionary impulses that we no longer we don't need as much in, in today's society. And then we come back and provide an explanation for why we did the things that we did, why we reacted the way that we reacted to things. There's a lot of things that you can do to force your mind to actually think about things. And a lot of it is, you know, being very, uh, very conscientious about your decisions, taking time to think through outcomes before you make decisions. And there's not a lot in our political process that rewards those processes. That's true. That's tweeting, true. retweeting, posting things on Facebook. We're, we're primed to accept information that we, that already fits with our viewpoint and reject things that, that, that come into conflict with our views. And there's not a lot that motivates people to, to do so otherwise. So one example uh, of, of a very small tweak in the system is Twitter just changed their uh, retweet button. So if you hit retweet, now the default is the quote retweet option meaning you're supposed to write something before you. So this is actually their way of getting people to stop. And for even just for a couple seconds, think about what you're about to 
send out. And, you know, again, this is a, this is a helping move a few grains of sand in, in a beach of problems, but that's, that's the process of, of, of getting back to compromise. That's the process of getting back to debate is, is for, is, is finding small ways to force ourselves to think about our actions and not just react to our environment. It seems to be almost a childlike level. What like we've got a two-year-old having a tantrum. I want it, I want it, I want it. Uh, I personally have dropped Facebook. I have dropped Twitter. I have dropped Instagram because I realized I was arguing with some 14-year-old Romanian troll in his mother's basement. And I'm not going to change anything there. I now go to meetings. I now go to you know, I read actual books and I talk to actual politicians and representatives, some of which I like, some of which I don't, but I'm getting real information. What do you think about the social media and uh, this attack on the press? The news is fake. All news is fake. Now that's the Republican side, but, and I don't want to put you in a box one way or the other, but uh, input with help. <laughs> Again, what we're seeing today, without getting without getting overly partisan, you know, we have a unique president. It's hard to argue that we don't currently have a a historic outlier in his willingness to just say what's right on the top of his mind. Um, but presidents attacking the press is not new. It's not even necessarily a Republican thing. No, Democratic no. presidents and Republican presidents in the past have criticized the media coverage, uh, you know, social media definitely serves in some capacity as an echo chamber where the, the algorithms that they have want to present you with information that you like. That's what helps them make money. It's not, it's not what you hear members of Congress complaining about that the algorithms are punishing conservatives. It's that there's a lot more young people on social media a lot more young people tend to be liberal. And so liberal things are going to get picked up and circulated more because that's what their audience wants to see. But when you're only being exposed to things that you already believe, there's no opportunity for change. Right. There's no opportunity for compromise. And that's, I think, the, the big change over the past 15 years is, you know, there used to be a, an argument that, you know, oh, conservatives are only watching Fox News and liberals are only watching MSNBC. But then political science went out and watched and it actually just turns out most people don't watch the news. So like, <laughs> that's not a problem. The problem isn't that we're sorting based off of our news consumption because most people just don't consume news. The problem is now our social communities are sorting so clearly along these lines that we're just not exposed at all to any countervailing considerations. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Uh, a conundrum, and I don't think there is an easy answer. Uh, I think you're in a unique position to be able to share information with your students. Uh, what do you hope students, based upon what we've been talking about, will take out of your class? What tools might you empower them, like the book you recommended? How can we as educators do a positive good, not for a bias left or a bias right, uh, but for a, a good, solid, moderate uh, approach? And, or is that possible? Oh, I, I definitely think it's possible. I always like to ask my students at the end of a class if they have any inklings of which way I lean. And then if, if, they, if, if the class, you know, gives me one side or the other too much. I know I adjust it going forward because I'm there to teach them the rules of the game. They get to go out and play the game by themselves. Right. I'm just there to teach them the rules. But these are unprecedented times and we now have some players in the political system who in addition to pushing for their view of how government should work, are attempting to manipulate the rules of the game so that they can hold disproportionate sway over that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's difficult to teach 
those types of concepts without coming down one way or the other as whether or not it is normatively good or normatively bad. I want my students to go out into the world and to be able to, to see when political players are playing the game fairly and when political players are bending the rules mm -hmm. to fit their ambitions. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be able to assess the credibility of the information that's coming to them. Um, you know, when I was, when I would teach uh, uh, high school students who were, who were just, uh, just graduating, it was their, the summer before, before their freshman year, mm -hmm. the, the number of students who didn't, like, at that stage in the game, didn't know that there were biases in the, you know, that Fox News was presenting something different than CNN, was presenting something different than MSNBC. Mm -hmm. And just helping them uncover what is a reliable source, what is a credible source, and how to think about, you know, think about the information that's coming to them critically. That's, that's the, the skill set that I want political scientists to leave SOU with. Outstanding. Uh, anything that I have tap danced around and haven't hit yet or any points you'd like to make, I always like to give the guest an opportunity uh, to share. I wrote out little. I wrote out little bullet points to all your questions. I'm just seeing if I. If Thank I you. Good. <laughs> um, no, I, th I think we hit we hit all the big ones. All righty, uh, long term goal at SOU. I guess that's what we can close out with. You're hopefully going to be with us for a while. What would you like to see happen within your department, your discipline, uh, that you feel would be beneficial? Well, you know, my first long term goal is to get on campus. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> my, my, my second long-term goal uh, is I think that political science, as we teach it to undergrads, is very, very good at teaching them the rules of the game, the structure of government, how government works, why government works the way it does, where I think we could, we could better serve our students. And this isn't just SOU. This is how I just feel political right. science is taught around the country is to set them, you know, to, to emphasize the science of political science. How can we help them develop a toolkit that allows them to systematically measure, study, test hypothesis about how government works? How can we help them develop this toolkit? Because this toolkit, while, you know, we can teach it to them how to apply it to questions of government, questions of representation, it's a toolkit that's going to help them in a large number of career paths. So being able to take a step back and, and, and systematically study some phenomenon and clearly present your results, make an argument, that, that's a, that's a skill set that I think we could do more for. Outstanding. Well, once again, Sean, thank you for taking time out of a super busy schedule coming in. We look forward to coming, uh, you get finally getting to campus. If you do stop by, I'll buy you a coffee at least. And, uh, can't wait. Can't wait. Look forward to meeting you. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye.